Good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for coming and joining STAR at our Careers in Print and Broadcast Media panel today. I'm Anna Harris, Outgoing Station Manager at STAR, and we are very excited to be welcoming some fantastic speakers from across the industry this evening. Apologies that we're running slightly late with, you know, experiencing some tech issues, but we're rolling with it. Um, this session is going to be recorded and hopefully made available on our website after the session. And so over the next 45 minutes, we'll be touching on a variety of themes all surrounding careers in the industry before handing over to you guys, our lovely audience. So make sure you're submitting your questions through the chat box and we'll try and get through as many of those as we can. At STAR, we know how passionate uh, students at this university are about creating and engaging with great content and that many of you are interested in pursuing this passion after university. It is a competitive sector, but as our speakers today show, it's one that St Andrews alumni can very much thrive in. So with that in mind, uh, I'd like to introduce our fantastic panellists this evening. We've got Louise Minchin, Sam Peach, Robbie Collin and Amanda Litherland. Um, and we might be welcoming Tim Samuels in a moment. We're just working through uh, all the technical fun stuff. Um, so we'll start with Louise. Louise is well known on our screens as one of the lead presenters of BBC Breakfast News. She studied Spanish at St Andrews before joining the BBC, uh, before joining the BBC, reporting for everything from local stations to the BBC World Service before joining Radio 5 Live and then the BBC News Channel. Uh, we also welcome Sam today. Sam left St Andrews in 2015 and joined the BBC's production traineeship soon after. Since then, he's gone on to produce content from across the BBC's radio documentaries unit and BBC Sounds, including Fortunately with V and Jane and The Untold. Uh, we're also welcoming Robbie Collin. Robbie is another alumni of The Saint and he's taken his film journalism from St Mary's Place to Fleet Street as chief film critic for The Daily Telegraph. He contributes to a wide range of film media across the industry and occasionally guest presents Kermode and Mail's film review on Radio 5 Live. And finally, we also welcome Amanda Litherland. Amanda is who we have to thank for the 24 hour library during exam season, having served as the union's director of representation in 2013. And she now produces and presents the podcast Radio Hour on BBC Radio 4 Extra. She has a background in comedy and she's working on some writing projects as well, which is very exciting. Um, so a huge thank you to our panelists joining us today. I, it's really great that you've all been able to join us. Um, I'm gonna start off by asking you guys then to tell us a little bit about what you got up to St. Uh, in St Andrews and whether that's been important to you in your career. Uh, Robbie, if I can go to you first. Yes, sure. Um, thank you so much for having me tonight. It's very exciting to, 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 to be here. Um, at St Andrews, I suppose the, 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 the biggest influence on it, I mean, I, look, I don't know what the town's like these days, but when I was there, there was absolutely nothing to do unless you organised it yourself. And so there was this kind of impetus constantly to be getting up to something and doing something productive and fun um, that would hopefully tick both those boxes. So I was especially motivated to get involved with The Saint. I'd done the school magazine uh, when I was at high school in Edinburgh. And then it was as a result of being on The Saint, really in, in, in quite a casual capacity at first, and then getting more and more embroiled with the thing as, as, as the years wore on. Um, that I realised that newspaper journalism was something that really appealed to me and something that I wanted to do as a career. At that stage, there was no sort of consideration that film criticism was was the form that would take. Uh, I mean, I studied uh, philosophy of film as part of my degree, but it was um, it was very much just from personal interest. My my big thing was to get into newspapers somehow, and I think the fact that St Andrews makes you makes you do these things for yourself. Um, was a huge motivating factor and you know when it came out to to obviously a, a very competitive jobs market then as it is now um, it sort of gave me that additional drive to keep pushing and to try you know different titles different possible routes in until finally uh, I, I, I got there. Fantastic yeah I think everyone in St Andrews knows all too well that feeling of becoming more and more embroiled in some in something until you feel like you know it's your whole life. Um, Sam what about you? Uh, yeah so um, yeah again so it's brilliant to be here and to, and to be chatting so uh, I would kind of uh, echo what Robbie said really the kind of um, I, for me it was kind of um, uh, a big part of my student experience was uh, being in Blind Mirth, which was the uh, improvised comedy group. But um, I think that's probably, I, I think they're still getting strong, which is great news. Um, but I, I think that's probably indicative of a lot of people's uh, St Andrew's experience in the sense that you get yourself fully involved in something and it's really that space to kind of uh, experiment and collaborate and kind of 
build something creatively and then to kind of see how it how it how it goes and maybe evaluate that afterwards is a, a kind of really good opportunity and you to be able to kind of work so closely with people I feel like there's always kind of five or six people who you kind of get to know uh, kind of everything about them as you all kind of build this thing together uh, so yeah Blind Mirth is that for me but also um, uh, a bit of musical theatre too as well that I was involved in too and then so yeah those were, and then uh, a bit of uh, a bit of cross country running when I had the time, but uh, mostly I was kind of running between uh, the theatres and that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's that's fantastic. I think we have some Merthers in tonight, so I'm sure they'll be happy to hear that. Um, Louise, what about yourself? Um, first of all, I mean, this is so embarrassing. Can you see and hear me? Yes, we can. <laughs> yes, we can see and hear you. <laughs> oh God, it's like being on breakfast television all over again. Uh, what was my life? I mean, I just still have a very special um, part of my heart that belongs to St Andrews. I absolutely love the place, love what I studied. I I don't know about you, all you, all of you, but I, you know, you can study so many different things. I went, I think, to study um, international relations and philosophy, and ended up with a degree in Spanish. Um, and I like you, you know, there was so little to do. You kind of found your own uh, things to do, didn't you? And I spent a lot of time um, going for long walks, which I still go on a scuba diving and just kind of fell passionately in love with Spanish and you might not think that's particularly useful for my career now obviously um, but I wrote again like many of you I wrote for the Chronicle so my kind of journalism started there and, and this week I've just looked took because it was International Women's Day and I was doing something for it actually um, I found my dissertation um, and I reread it this week and it was about um, the image of women um, in the media in Spain because I was studying Spanish. And, and it's so interesting reading that 30 years on and seeing what's changed and what hasn't changed and to, to kind of realise that my career was really embedded right there uh, in St Andrews. That's where it started. And it's been a very, if you look back now, a kind of very to, surprising to me, a kind of clear path. So St Andrews has been so important to, to where I am now. That is, yeah, that is amazing. I think I uh, probably speak for quite a few students when I say, having just finished my dissertation, I hope it remains buried forever. <laughs> um, Amanda, what, what about you? I know you were involved in uh, all sorts of things. Yeah, so for me, it was definitely my kind of extracurriculars that um, kind of led me to where I am today. So my degrees in medieval history and most people in radio are very surprised to hear that because uh, obviously not necessarily what you'd think. Um, but yeah, I was one of the founding members of the St Andrews Review um, at a similar time to Sam being in Blind Mirth. So, you know, we were friendly rivals, still great friends to this day. <laughs> um, and yeah, I did a lot of that um, and a lot of mermaids as well. So um, not just the acting and the comedy, but the producing side as well. And that was definitely something that when I came to have interviews for uh, media stuff, um, just showing that initiative and showing that you can have a creative idea, but you can get it done is really important. And um, I think St Andrews offers so many great opportunities for all that sort of stuff. Um, and I did have a show on Star as well. I think we had five listeners once. That was amazing. Um, so always good. Yeah, definitely very much uh, know the feeling. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's it's great to hear, you know, so much about how student life is is been so central uh, to you in your careers. But beyond, you know, St Andrews, what has motivated you uh, in your career? Louise, if, if I could come to you first on this. Um, so what's motivated me um it's kind of for me it's very clear in some ways it's about stories i'm interested in what's happened why it's happened who it's happened to and for me it's always been back down to that kind of basic kind of journalism those sort of key questions of journalism and i've just you know i was a news addict when i was at st andrews um i'm a news addict now it's just what i do every day and there's not a day goes by unfortunately sometimes <laughs> when i don't uh, listen, watch, read the news. Um, so yeah, that's so I've been very motivated. But the the kind of core is journalism, um, and then television is something that's you know I started out in radio actually. So so did a little bit of writing for the Chronicle. I then went straight to radio. I spent many many years in radio, and radio I would kind of describe as my apart from Spanish uh, first love, uh, and still I love radio. And then television sort of happened um, by mistake really. Um, I, I kind of got a, an opportunity um, at some point. I just kind of got a lucky break, really. But it wasn't something I set out to do. 
and then sort of looking back at um you know I do podcasts now called Her Spirit which is about encouraging women to take up sport for kind of mental health um, and physical benefits and again that's again back to my kind of core values it's about people it's about stories so yeah television wasn't something I set out to do at all but motivation is to is to kind of as far as you can and you know there are all caveats around this but you know get to the truth tell people the truth and also where I am now particularly on the time of day that I work I'm very conscious that there could be a five-year-old running past the telly when I'm telling some really bad news. So a real conscious effort to kind of tell people the bad news, but in a in the nicest way possible. I'm not sort of about talking about not telling, you know, softening it up, but do you see what I mean with a particular tone? And that's some, you know, there's something that's obviously runs through my mind given the time. You know, we're inviting the people's houses when you're not necessarily monitoring what's on the telly because you're making a cup of tea or you're making toast or getting the sandwiches ready. So, yeah, that's um, the, the journalism really is the key thing that goes through my career. Yeah, definitely. And I, I don't know, I think, I, again, you know, a lot of um, St Andrew's students will really, I think, resonate with that idea of, of storytelling and creating narratives and, and sharing uh, stories, especially in, in such an international um, kind of sphere. Uh, Robbie, what, what about you? Um, I mean, in terms of professional motivation, being a critic is, is is quite odd in that respect because there's no obvious shape to your career. You know, you're, you're just writing about stuff that you're interested in for money and providing the money's good and the interesting stuff still interests you. You're sort of doing about as well professionally as you could ever hope to, to do. Um, in ideological terms, I think it's, it's more interesting because you, you sort of have to, to reflect to yourself. Critics do not generally have a great reputation among the fields that they criticise. So you have to keep asking yourself, you know, what use are you in, in this whole equation? Are you entertaining your readers? Are you making them think? Are you pointing them towards great films they might not have otherwise discovered? Um, on In bigger picture terms, are you helping nudge the culture? You know, however, infinitesimally one person can do this in a better, more productive direction. I think a really interesting example of that today was the announcement of this year's BAFTA nominations for the film awards that are coming up next month. Now, people like me, and this is not just something I've been doing as a solo thing, for years have been harping on about how boring and how reductive and how enthralled to the Oscars the BAFTAs are year in, year out. And they always choose the obvious stuff from Hollywood that's had enormous amounts of money spent on campaigns and they don't really reflect about local talent enough. And this year, partly as a result of a big voting um, review that BAFTA's conducted, and also partly as a result of the pandemic, which has completely thrown off any sort of traditional award season campaigning techniques that people might otherwise turn to. The nominations slate that was announced this afternoon is completely wonderful and it's eccentric and it's mad and it's identifiably British and it speaks to, to national tastes, I think, and particularly to emerging national tastes and the way that national tastes are changing at the moment. And it doesn't feel enthralled to Hollywood. Now, would BAFTA have embarked upon that voting review without people like me moaning on for like 10 years prior to that, saying this is boring, this is rubbish, do something about it? Maybe they would have, but maybe not. So you can take a bit of pride that you've you've possibly helped shunt the art form in a, in a better direction. I mean, I think the thing about, about being a critic is the, the job is very difficult to complain about. You know, it involves a lot of slogging and a lot of admin. Nobody would, would believe, you know, if, if I was to, to tell you now. But there is also this, conversely, this real glamorous site at where you get to go to film festivals, you get to interview people that you, you greatly admire. All of that stuff is deeply satisfying on its own terms, however shallow that may be. But fundamentally, you want to make people feel I'm glad I read that, you know, when they get to the end of your piece, be it, you know, a 300 word quickie review or a 2000 word piece in the weekend's art supplement. And I think just having people glad they read what you wrote is about as much as you can hope for. Yeah, I, I definitely. I mean, I don't want to get too bogged down in, in coronavirus -y stuff, but do you think that this is something that has uh, changed the industry? And do you think that will be kind of a feature to stay, if, if that makes sense. In terms of film, I mean, overwhelmingly, you know, we've, we've all, we've spent the year out of cinemas, but probably among us, we've watched more films than ever. So we as critics have had to seriously, you know, react to how people are consuming films now. Netflix is enormous, Disney Plus is enormous, uh, Amazon Prime is enormous. Netflix, uh, sorry, Disney Plus didn't even exist uh, a year ago, barely in the UK. It had just launched at the start of the, I think, something like a week before or a week into the pandemic, which is which is crazy. 
So, so we've had to really adapt what it is that we think about films. You know, is, does the Queen's Gambit qualify as television in the traditional sense, or is it a multi-part film? What about one division? You know, what about all these different ways that the art form is uh, adapting to this new streaming landscape? When cinemas reopen, who's going to go back? How is cinema going to lure us back? There are so many fascinating things, and it, although it's it's a grim thing to have lived through in so many terrible respects. It's a very exciting time, I think, to be interested in cinema and where cinema's going and to be kind of reacting to that. This is something that's uh, overwhelmingly changed in the industry since I joined it about 15 years ago, is that you have to be very reactive. If something occurs, if there's a story breaks, if, if, if someone makes some kind of crazy announcement like Disney did before Christmas when they said we're doing, you know, eight new Star Wars series, 10 new Marvel series, this is how, you know, these are the direction these franchises are going in. You need to think on your feet and you need to process this information on your reader's behalf and tell them, you know, what does this really mean? And it's your best guess. You know, you're, you're ultimately it's, 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 you know, journalism's the first draft of history. That's a, 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 a truism about the form, I think. But um, but it's never felt more true, I think, than it does now. Oh, I love that phrase. I've, I've not heard that before. That's fantastic. Um, I'm just going to put this kind of conversation on pause for a brief moment. And Sam and Amanda, we will come back to you uh, because I think we have just been joined by Tim Samuels. Tim, can you hear me? I can. I feel like I'm, I'm on location uh, <laughs> as, a for, as a foreign correspondent rather than just being completely inept at Teams. Definitely <laughs> using a, produ a, a producer as always. Which is, uh, uh, which is, do not which is, worry about uh, teams. But I've been watching. I've been watching and listening uh, uh, anonymously and, and, and <laughs> uh, enjoying enjoying it all. Well, it is absolutely fantastic um, to be joined by you. I, I will just give you a quick introduction. Tim Samuels is an award-winning documentarian, broadcaster and author, and he should be well noted for founding The Saint during his time in St Andrews. Uh, I say that grudgingly as head of star. He's created content mm. dealing with ageism, racism, mental health and more. And most recently, he's been writing on masculinity and the modern man. We're very glad you've been able to join us. We're currently uh, just chatting about... Um, what motivates us in our careers? I say us. I I do not have yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> I can hear. I can hear. I can hear. I can hear Robbie's wise words. Oh, fantastic! Um, so uh, would you would you like to chip in on that? What what motivates you in your career? Oh my gosh. Um, well, for, first of all, I just have to say when I when I was at St Andrews, um, we had the we had the great idea that um, we were going to start a student radio station. This was probably in, I guess 95, 94, 95, I don't know when it was. Um, and with the, with, there was a committee and it was elected and I was uh, I was made chairman. And, uh, and then we realised there was absolutely no way to, to, to do a radio station. No one had done any due diligence uh, around whether you could get a licence or not at the time. So uh, we did a couple of leaflets in the in the library and then and then uh, it completely crashed. And I went and joined the Chronicle um, and then found it a little bit tedious and um, closed it down and launched the Saints and uh, you know I, I believe it's still going which is um, which is really great to see um, so well done for getting a radio station off the air <laughs> it was more impressive than our completely half-assed attempt um, back in the mid 90s um, as, as for what motivates uh, I guess on, on different levels I mean um, uh, like there's the kind of idealistic side and then there's the sort of more pragmatic you know the, the programs you're desperate to make and and occasionally you hit the sweet spot and you make something and you can kind of champion a social injustice or try and make a difference with something or do something incredibly creative and then there's just those programs which, which you can get commissioned which you're which you're glad to make and pay the mortgage um and i guess it sort of waxes and wanes your, across your career but for, for me it's always i've always enjoyed taking something serious and, and then trying to bring a bit of sort of entertainment values to it or be slightly more renegade with it um, and not, not be conformist, which is exactly what I was trying to do with the Saints. Um, so not a lot has changed now. You know, instead of doing cartoons, mocking Yars and, um, and Neds, uh, just sort of channel that into documentaries now. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I think it did take 10 years, but I think Star Wars eventually started in 2005 and yeah. hopefully I haven't run it into the ground just yet. Um, Sam, if, if I can come to you on, on that question. 
Yeah, of course. So I mean, I'm, I'm very lucky to kind of uh, in in the job that I do to work in the, across uh, like different types of documentaries. So um, yeah, kind of it's I guess it's, it's a case of sort of wearing slightly different hats. I think um, with something like uh, Fortunately, which is a kind of like weekly chatty podcast, uh, that's a kind of you want to be able to um, you know give people a, a chance to chat and escape and enjoy and do that lovely thing that podcasts can do, which you feel like you're sitting around with your friends and then also have that as a kind of a way in to sort of think about the ways that people can in, in kind of learn a bit of new things or get a new perspective on something. Uh, and then I, I think with more possibly when I'm able to work on sort of, you know, kind of more sort of serious journalistic stuff and, um, you know, kind of thinking about wanting to identify new patterns or kind of interesting trends or uncover something genuinely new. You know, it's a lot of pride, sort of personal pride if there's, you know, kind of a story that I feel like is got some meaning that is kind of been able to shine a light on from the work that, that I've done. Um, yeah, and I guess also not forget amidst all that to kind of enjoy yourself as well and kind of, you know, make sure that you still kind of have fun and sort of slightly pushing out the comfort zone too, I think. So yeah, I'm very lucky to kind of work in those areas, but sort of trying to kind of balance out those things too and not forget that you deserve to enjoy yourself as well. Yeah, it's definitely. I, I think, you know, it is it can be so much fun to uh, to get involved with this sort of thing. Um, Amanda, how about you? Um, yeah, kind of similar to Sam. My, my job kind of sits across a few different things. So I present Podcast Radio Hour, which is recommending podcasts and speaking to podcasters, uh, which is really great. And I just love working with different people and hearing new ideas and being able to share that with people. But um, another part of my job is that I work with the Radio 4 presentation team, which is the newsreaders and continuity announcers. So basically everything that stitches together the um, the the radio for that isn't the programs um, and sometimes that can be quite chaotic uh, which is great you know uh, most of the time it's really um, calm and everything sorted but if a program doesn't come in on time or something falls off air you know we're the people that have to fix it and um, I really I quite love the chaos sometimes when it does happen um, but it just talking about like you know the pandemic uh, sort of this time last year obviously everything got thrown up in the air and we had to change all the schedules and everything um, I also had to keep doing my show which obviously I normally would do in a studio and I have been doing from this spare bedroom for a year um, dealing with all the sort of technical things of that and um, yeah it's, it's just been it's been good to, to have that challenge but I think that especially at the BBC and I I think some uh, of the others might have felt this too is that it, it's never been I've never felt more kind of valued in what we do and that it's more important uh, both on that level of you know getting the news to people and keeping people informed but also just giving people a bit of a laugh and I really feel like, you know, sometimes people really rag on the BBC. There's always the question of the license fee and things like that. But um, I think that this year has just felt it's felt a good place to work. And it's felt like the stuff that we make has really been appreciated. And so, yeah, that just uh, it's always, always nice to feel like that. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really, a really lovely point, and I, I think that's really interesting. Um, thank you so much, everyone, so far. This has been fantastic. I just want to like cut in here and say we do have a Q and A going. So if you're watching this at home and you've got any questions that you think I'm not ask, ask, uh, asking, um, do feel free to pop in on the Q and A, send us a question, and we'll try and get through a couple of those towards the end. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about was, you know, I think Robbie's already touched on it. This is an industry that is changing all the time and is really uh, obviously very susceptible to lots and lots of things going on around us. Um, how do you feel that the industry has kind of evolved during your career? Louise, can I come back to you on that? Is that because I'm the oldest? I'm kidding, <laughs> but I am. <laughs> I mean, I just, it's so lovely hearing you talking about, I mean, we dreamt of radio stations. I left in 92, so I'm a bit before you guys. But um, let me tell, uh, so the industry has changed so hugely. I've been thinking about it over the last few days because you asked me this question. So first of all, the technology is just extraordinary. So when I started, none of you will know about this probably, maybe you do, Tim. I used to, I started radio and we used to have a thing called Newers, which was our recording thing. And it was about this big, okay? And it was reel to reel. So we had tape and it went from run one reel to the other reel. OK, and you'd record it on these things. You had 15 minutes was the maximum you could record before you had a thread in another one. And then you would cut it with a razor, a bit of chalk where you'd cut the um out. And you'd mark the um, and cut it with a bit of razor and literally stick it back together. So 
I mean, we have come so far. We wouldn't have any tape in our office. Um, our studio is fully, fully obviously digital. I mean, it's just unbelievable. So that's the massive change. But I mean, just so fundamental. And, and you know, gone are the days that I can cut stuff now because, I mean, there was a time when I could cut digitally, but I've kind of lost those skills now. So you really need to be on it these days. So that's number one thing. And then the other thing, of course, I mean, you won't even believe this probably, Anna, but we didn't have that thing called the internet. <laughs> there was no Google. There was nothing. I'm so, I mean, it's just massive, isn't it? Um, so that's really, I mean, that's so incredible as a presenter, because even when I started back presenting, I don't think we had, you know, access to the internet. I think I was one of the first people, I'm not kidding, at the BBC to ask for an email account. And they were like, oh, what's that? Why do you want one of those? It's unthinkable. I'm getting a bit sort of, you know, passionate about this now, so I'm sorry. And then, and then of course, you know, there's the access. So, so with that comes the instant access to news, um, the Twitter, the so, and then social media is another whole, you know, ream of stuff that we're having to cope with. So the changes have been utterly unbelievable. And you know, sort of had to sort of sit and hold on, don't you, where they come along and then choose which, you know, I was, was I an early adopter to Twitter? I don't know. I've been on like 10, 11 years. I suppose I wasn't, but. Yeah, massive, massive changes, but at the core of it are still what I care about, which are the stories, um, but you just get much quicker access to them. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Uh, Amanda, how about you? Um, I would say that, yeah, the, the, the great thing is that now you can kind of make stuff yourself a lot more. I mean, obviously, podcasts have existed for a long time, um, but now it's a, it's a lot easier for if you want to make some sort of you know, audio documentary, you don't have to wait to be commissioned. You can buy a mic for quite cheap or even do it on your phone and just start making stuff. Same with, you know, film things. You don't have to wait for somebody to like, say, go ahead on a project. You can start a YouTube channel. You can do all of this. And I think that's a really, a really great advantage for people who are starting out today is that you, you don't have to wait for permission so much. I think on the negative side, I guess there's, there's kind of fewer trainee schemes and stuff at the minute. So um, that is that's how I got in and that was really useful and so you do have to use your own initiative a lot more um, but like I said I think there's a, a lot of benefits to that so yeah def definitely um, I mean I think a lot of us again graduating fourth years will be able to sympathize with the uh, scramble to find training schemes and and get stuff lined up so we'll keep our fingers crossed for everybody on that one um, Robbie what about you um I I think, I mean, just to echo everything that Louise said about the, the internet, it is completely transformative. And um, I remember the days when in in Sally's in in 1999, when I arrived, even we would sort of pop down to the, the internet room to check our emails once a day, maybe to see if anything was happening in the outside world. So it's just it's, it's crazy how, how, how enormous that that shift has been. I think one thing that the um, the internet's done for for film journalism specifically is it's made it possible to do it as a kind of a hobby or as in this kind of slightly dilettantish way where people who have uh maybe financial support from their family or they have another job on the go that kind of pays the bills will be uh doing a feature here and a review there and a little bit of coverage for this person that person and it makes it far harder to carve out a career now i think in, in in this discipline specifically than it maybe was when when I joined you know about I got into journalism about 20 years ago um so so there's been an, an enormous change in that respect also because of social media you find that the the conversation is massively driven by the US and of course in in America they have this insane culture war where everything is entrenched two sides you know you either support this person or you support that person and you mustn't ever show any kind of glimmer of admiration for something someone on the other side does and it's sort of sad and depressing to see that infecting British arts journalism. Um, and it's it's something that you kind of have to consciously, I think, tack away from. Because if you're on Twitter, this is the entire lens through which all of your cultural news and considerations are, 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 are being refracted. So you have to remember, well, wait a minute. No, I'm not writing for you know, the New York uh, media circles. I'm writing for a, a readership of a UK broadsheet newspaper. Um, and, you know, we need to kind of bear in mind what is it, you know, that, that our sort of core audience cares about and what, what will they become exasperated by if I start wanging on about as if, you know, I'm in some kind of bar in Brooklyn. 
Um, I think something that's very, very specifically like up to date interesting is the way that you know platforms like Substack and uh, Patreon have emerged, whereby people are being paid again for uh, for their work. And I think it's interesting because it's a move back towards that curated writing that newspapers were have been providing you know since time immemorial. What those platforms don't have yet, by and large, are editors and sub editors and fact checkers. And I firmly believe that will come, at which point the internet will have effectively invented or reinvented newspapers again. So I think, you know, however bleak things seem now, if you're trying to get involved in the, mar in, in the jobs market, and, and, and I know it can be hellish to even think, where, where do I start? I, I do hope and believe that within five years time, it, the landscape will have changed dramatically as a result of these paid for platforms. And I do hope that we move back towards this, this economy where, um, you know, it's almost like bottled water versus tap water. If the product is more appealing and you're getting more nutrients out of it and it's more convenient and it's better for you, you know, you will, you're prepared to pay for it, even if the free equivalent is kind of pouring into your house via your, your you know, via your Wi-Fi router, uh, whether you like it or not. Yeah, definitely. I think that point about Patreon is, is really, really interesting. It will definitely be interesting to see how that changes. Yeah, even even in the next couple of years. Um, Tim, what, what do you think about this? Sorry, Tim, I think you're muted. There we go. Uh. Uh, yes, I, I'm going to insert myself in between Robbie and Louise. Uh, I I remember having to go to the computer lab uh, <laughs> to the only place you could actually check your email. And the only person I could email was my IR tutor, Dr. Ranstorp, who was incredibly impressed that once for an essay, I found something on the internet and added it as a source. Um, didn't quite tip me into a first, but I'm still bitter about that. Um, so, but I do also remember cutting with tape and then you'd, it would fall on the floor and your chair would go over it and it would ruin everything that you'd recorded. Um, it wasn't elegant. Uh, I guess what's interesting for me is the, like, what, I guess what Amanda was saying, um, it's, it's a sort of double-edged sword, the access to entry. When I first started, you know, it was, it was, it was quite an elitist thing to get on air, um, you know, to make your own TV something that was broadcast quality for TV or radio, there was quite a sort of barrier to entry. So it sort of meant that when you were in that, you know, when I was I was a BBC does a news trainee, when you were within the BBC, you were quite sort of protected. Uh, whereas now it's it's a free for all, which on the one hand is sort of very democratizing, but on the other hand, I think it's sort of, it's really driven down cost because content is so cheap now and anyone can make it and anyone can make it to quite a half decent standard it means that there's sort of left money to go around really so you know i've i've seen budgets just slashed over the years you know when i was at newsnight as a correspondent you know th there was a kind of beautiful foreign film every night and they were great you could go off to um malawi and do a 15 minute film and it was luxurious and luscious you had a great camera man or woman and and um i've just you know newsnight's doing i think maybe two two short films a week now or ra radio four documentaries the budgets used to be kind of much much bigger and you know i remember i've been asked you know for radio four well do you want a producer or a hotel um wow. uh, always take the producer um so i just see i've seen sort of budgets drop and that and that makes it makes it harder to do i think the the kind of higher quality stuff more routinely um, and then the money goes to somewhere like, you know, Netflix or Spotify and they want true crime. So I guess, you know, I've seen current, you know, when I started out doing current affairs, there were there was good budget to do kind of quality current affairs. Whereas now that sort of it gets really pared back and people want even the BBC is, is it going to rate? Is it going to rate? Um, or they're not interested. And I think another shift which I've noticed is um, I, saw, I was thinking if I was starting out now, um, I would be more opinionated. Um, you know, I, you go through the BBC and you sort of pride yourself on being nuanced and balanced. But we're sort of at the age now where you, I mean, I can't stand social media and, and, and barely engage, but you know, you want that. I, I was listening to an article the other day with a, with a New York Times writer who was saying that if he got sacked, his helicopter out of there was that he's got a quarter of a million Twitter followers. And you build that, I think, by being, you, you stake out a, a, 
a position in the culture what that Robbie was alluding to, and you go for it, and you and you you know you you make yourself slightly controversial, and you build audience that way, and you get books because that you know we, we know that you're going to say that point of view, and we want to counterbalance that. So it just sort of feels that that uh, there's there's kind of more currency for being a bit more polemic and less nuanced um, than when I started, and it feels you know maybe it'll, you know it'll come back that um there's less scope for that kind of just sort of rigorous journalism about stuff which might not bring in a huge audience um hopefully the you know the sort of pendulum will swing sort of back and forwards but i guess if i was starting out now i would think okay how can i build my brand which is a horrible term and really push it and carve out a niche for myself rather than just going into straightforward sort of journalism. Very yeah, very, very interesting. Um Sam, what what do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I would agree and obviously the kind of the explosion of podcasts, especially in the last kind of few years, has kind of really sort of dramatically changed um kind of the way that uh so I kind of do my job and my colleagues do my job directly in our department. Um I'm uh, kind of one positive that I think uh, that I've noticed. I mean, I saw I became a trainee in 2015, and so even to sort of seen since then is that the the conversation is being had a lot more about representation and sort of opportunities and giving opportunities to lots of different kinds of people, um, and that's something that I feel like is on the minds of everybody a lot a lot more. So I, that's something that I feel has has changed for the better over those times that. It seems I think that uh, hopefully there's at least the, the sort of the, the start of the movements towards uh, more equal opportunities for lots of different people in, in journalism. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that's something that is, is fantastic um, to be happening. We, you know, we have about 20 minutes left then. So I, I want to just make the most of the time we, we have today. So a lot of people are coming in uh, to the Q&A asking about this, and I know it's on a lot of our minds as students, but sort of semi quickly what what would your top tip be to a student you know in a lot of our like a lot of us in our position who is looking to break in what would you be suggesting uh amanda would you like to start us on that one um my main bit of advice to anyone has always been basically don't be a dick uh, which is you know <laughs> just be a friendly person you know i think that you everyone i know who's done well in this industry is really you know good to work with is a good person is pleasant to be around and you know takes their initiative helps out doesn't mind doing some rubbish jobs at the start like making the tea um and honestly like if you're if you're a friendly person that people get along with you'll go really far and hopefully that's good news because if you aren't then you wouldn't be here so it's okay <laughs> oh fantastic um sam what do you think yeah, I completely agree to kind of uh, yeah, with, with that notion. Um, and then also, I guess I would uh, I would kind of uh, add to that too. Don't worry if you feel like you've made a mistake. Try not to obsess too much around it, about that kind of thing, and just try and sort of move forward and be positive. Um, I would say think about the kind of stuff that you like, whatever that might be, whether that's written or visual or audio. Find the people um, who are making that thing. You know, kind of that's the brilliant thing about credit lists at the end that their names are out there. Often these people have websites or LinkedIn pages, and a lot of people in the media, in a nice way, like to talk about themselves. So they'll probably give you a time of day to kind of talk about what they do and tell you about their jobs and that kind of thing. So, and that's a, a really good way to learn and <laughs> to find out how the structures of these things go. And um, I would say, you know, it's OK not to like something as well. So, you know, I, I tried out different working in different areas and didn't think it was for me. So uh, and then you kind of dip in somewhere else. And so you never know what, what might be coming around the corner that turns out to be your thing, even if you didn't think it was at the beginning. And it's OK to change your mind. That's yeah, that's really reassuring. Thank you, Sam. Uh, Louise, what do you think? Um, I loved what um, Amanda said. Quite right. I started making tea on the Today programme for John Humphreys way back. So, you know, we all start somewhere. Um, really important things. Um, you've all kind of mentioned this, but um, I think what, where you are in a really good position, Anna, where we weren't necessarily in that position is you can do this now yourself. And I would be very conscious if you want to go into journalism uh, on your Twitter or whatever you're on, whether you're on TikTok or wherever it is, make sure that is what you're doing. 
do you see what I mean? You know, you can put out pieces, you can comment, you can all the rest of it. Because the first thing I would do, literally, if I was seeing you, in fact, I haven't done it, Anna. How, why haven't I done that? How annoying. Um, is look you up, is see what you're saying, see what you're thinking. Do you see what I mean? So be very conscious. And, you know, I know that's really unfair and you're a student and whatever. And I've got a daughter who's at university, but she's very conscious about what she puts on social media because that is, that is your, that's your brand, isn't it? So be careful about your brand. Um, and, and do it yourself. Go out there, make a film. If you're interested in whatever, I'm interested in triathlon, which is really nerdy, and but really fun. You know, that's what I would be talking about, for example. Talk about what you're quite right, Sam, what you're passionate about, okay? Um, and then the other thing um, I would say about ideas, and we, you know, we, we do a programme that's three hours and 15 minutes every day. You know, my producers come in, they're in there right now. They probably emailed me in the last five minutes with what's on tomorrow's programme. They came in at 9.15 this morning. They've been working on it all day. They have got to fill that with content and with ideas. And I think you're right, you might, you're right about content. There is so much, but also there is so little good content. Do you see what I mean? And ideas are, that's, you know, that's what, that's money. Do you see what I mean? That, don't sell your ideas. You will have an idea, Anna, that is really good. Do not give that away. Guard your content, guard your ideas and make sure that you don't give them, I mean, I've just told you to give them away from pre, but do you see what I mean? Just be very careful. I've spoken to so many young people who come to me and go, oh, yeah, I gave this idea to, and I've done it myself. There are, there are programs on Radio 4, which I pitch to Radio 4 producers. And they're now on and I get, you know, they just said, oh, no, there's no, no space for that, Louise. Well, guess what? They made a whole series out of it. So guard your stuff. Yeah. So, that, yeah, there's lots of different ideas there. And that other thing about reaching out, reach out to people, because not everybody will come back to you, Sam. But, you know, Anna, you know, we will we will have a conversation after this today because you've done that. And that's, you know, really important thing to be brave enough to do that as well. Oh, thank you. That is fantastic. And yeah, I, I can second that. You know, I, I've done a bit of work experience and uh, I've got a lot of it just by networking via LinkedIn. So that's my two cents for this careers panel. <laughs> um, Robbie, what, what do you think? I think all the points made so far are excellent. I would stress if there's one thing you, you take away from this event, it's what Amanda said just there. You would be you would be amazed. Let me just put it that way. You'd be amazed at some of the nonsense that goes on. Just be be a decent person to work with. I would also say, you know, look, I'm not going to say you have to work for an outlet that you're ethically opposed to, but you, you have to kind of keep your options open. And, you know, when I left St Andrews, as I said earlier, I wanted to go into newspaper journalism. I had no idea that film criticism was 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 what was going to be so kind of fulfilling and exciting for me. You have to kind of write, a, write around, you know, try things out and, and challenge yourself to write about stuff that you're not initially interested in. Um, that's that's how I got into in, into writing about film. I, I think very easily my life could have led off on another path. I could have been a travel writer, you know, a, a motoring writer, perhaps, who knows? Um, there, there's all sorts of avenues that you can explore and you should be exploring earlier in your career. And honestly, having this kind of pressure to constantly turn around copy, certainly in print journalism, is very, very healthy. And if you kind of preen and, you know, fuss over one piece per month, that's not representative of what you can do as a journalist. You need to be in a situation where they're saying, you know, give us 800 words on this, you know, by lunchtime. And then you have to just kind of sit down and go blah. And the more often you do that, the better this you, you, your body gets into these rhythms and you, you can kind of churn out relatively high quality stuff quickly. Um, you won't get that if you just fixate on being, you know, I must be, um, you know, the Guardian's next restaurant reviewer. There are one million people around the country who want that job as well. You have to kind of be smart about it. Find your way in, try stuff out that you wouldn't necessarily have, have jumped on in the first place and just see where it leads you. Yeah, definitely. Thank, thank you so much, Robbie. Um, Tim, what, what do you think on that one? Um... I, I sort of agree with Louise, but disagree about the ideas. I think, like, keep your very, very best ideas back. But for me, the, the, the people I've most been most impressed by when hiring have been people that get in touch and say, oh, I like your show or something. Um, here are three ideas for it. And if those ideas, I, I th just through those ideas, I, I know instantly whether they have kind of got the right aptitude or not. So, and when I started out, you know, any time I've made a kind of jump in my career is when I've gone out and pitched, you know, I've taken ideas to people and pitched them um, because ideas are your currency. You know, people don't 
very rarely say we'd really like you to go and make this idea i mean it happens occasionally then it's great but um ideas the other thing i would say uh uh to amanda's point yes but in america in my experience working for american tv the opposite's true by the way <laughs> um, it seems that and especially the higher up you go uh it seems it seems a, a, an absolute quality unfortunately um I would say the technical skills are incredibly important. So uh, you sometimes think, oh, you know, if I'm going to be a producer or a, you know, TV or radio, I've got to go through this hoop and that hoop. Quite often in my experience, it's been like, okay, who's around who can shoot something or who's around who can record and edit something? So I think if you want to go into telly, the best thing you can do is learn how to uh, shoot on a, um, you know, broadcast quality camera. And that might be, you know, I mean, they're so cheap these days, a sort of DSR that's kind of got a nice lens on it. Or, get, you know, radio, have a little Zoom um, mic, learn how to edit on, you know, one of the, the audio editing programs, learn how to edit on Final Cut Pro for TV. And all of a sudden you, you go from researcher to AP very quickly, or you go from work experience to, oh, can you shoot second camera? Just being like, I think, quite often people stand on formality of well i'm not at that stage yet i better not but if you're there and you can do the job um you can very very quickly um sort of grow you grow into the role and i think when you work with indies independent production companies probably more so than the bbc you can go from sort of like nothing to sort of ap very quickly just because you, you're there you're you're a good you know, you're, you listen, you're, you're nice to people and you've got the skills. So I think just having the technical skills can make a make a real difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah, uh, Louise. <laughs> I just yes, want to say, come back. Can we, can, we agree, <laughs> can we agree, Tim, that ideas are currency and be careful how you spend them? How's that? Yes, yes, <laughs> I agree. And, and, and sometimes it might be like part of the problem is that like you might pitch an idea and you're not qualified to make it but you could say if this gets commissioned i want to be a researcher and i want a credit on this yeah mm -hmm. okay maybe maybe you maybe you're just yeah. better at negotiating with your <laughs> ideas i just i just wouldn't give yeah. mine away now unless i knew you know i wouldn't give them away unless i knew i was going to get something back for it yeah this but i think is, you can come up with very... come up come up with low-hanging fruit ideas like if you're if i was like at St Andrews now and I was writing to you to try and get work experience and or your producer I would say you know here's a couple of ideas I've got for the show you know you're not going to live and die by some breakfast news ideas it's not the documentary you want to make but the but the producer might say oh that's that's a really good idea and then you can come in and work on it good idea then, all right yeah <laughs> I basically agree we, we agree with each other yeah <laughs> Oh, I'm, I'm glad we've uh, we've uh, found some agreement on our panel today. Um, although I suppose a little bit of disagreement is, is probably always a good thing. Uh, we have got then time Best for a couple. Better for ratings. Of... <laughs> oh, absolutely. We've definitely got time then for a couple of questions. So um, I'll just come to you with uh, this one, which is from somebody going by hello to Jason, who says, "For Robbie, how useful is a website portfolio for your writing when applying for journalism roles?" Yeah, we've not done hello to Jason Isaacs yet. Thank you for that that little uh, shout out. Um, I think, yeah, an online portfolio, by all means, you should have uh, favourite pieces available to read. Um, I think ones that allow the reader to quickly get a flavour for of, of your writing, your versatility and range is really important to show off. You know, maybe one one or two pieces that, that show the, the quality and the depth of your reporting, but it should be up to date. It should be something that's, you know, relevant, topical, uh, not look like stuff that you laboured over for months on end five years ago and has just kind of sat there gathering dust ever since. Um, the, the, the other thing I would say is that editors, commissioning editors now have less time than they ever did and just do not be insulted if people simply do not reply because they are all, you know, like all of us, they're at home struggling through this awfulness and, 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 and trying to kind of just reach, reach the end of the day having hit their most important deadlines. So if you don't hear back, it's not a snub. It's um, if, if if someone tells you, you never get in touch again, that's the snub. Um, you just have to kind of keep slogging away and, and, and appreciate that um, that currently everyone is extraordinarily pressed for time. They will not always be able to give you this kind of full feedback on 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 what you've got in touch with. 
Fantastic, thank you. Um, Jade says, hello, I'm wondering what the transition from working on student run publications slash production teams to ones in the industry was like. Uh, thank you. Would anyone like to come in on this? <laughs> Radio silence, fantastic. Um, Tim, I mean, you worked on the Chronicle and relaunched the Saint. How did you find the transition for doing like student written journalism to, to television? Um, uh, tra traumatic because it's not as good fun because you're not just sat there working with all your mates um, somewhere in the student union who keep, keep trying to kick you out. Um, uh, I think, uh, I, I guess for me, print to TV was a it was a completely different skill set and I was lucky enough to sort of do a trainee course and and learn all that um, but I would say when I go back and do written stuff now which I, you know I still do bits and pieces I I sort of think it was doing the student paper that I kind of cut my teeth and got that's where I get that's where I sort of developed a voice for without trying to sound too wanky um, and I, I think you find that the transition isn't that hard. You know, there's so much. Um, I don't know. Maybe Robbie was alluding to it. There's so much sort of bluster in the media. You know, there's so much pomposity and people pretending they're something that they're not really. It's not. You know, going from student journalism to you know other journalism isn't isn't as big a step. You know, there's a there's, there's a learning curve, but I think you, you, you know you'll be fine. There's there's a lot of people who are just chances, <laughs> and um, it's it's not it, it's not such a big gulf. I think the you know the interesting thing is going from TV to radio or radio to TV. Um, and for me it was quite humbling going from you know I'd done TV for years and did radio and went and did a live radio show on Five Live. I found that completely different and I was utterly useless for the first season or two. Um, so it was like the kind of gear shifts between different media um, can crunch a bit but it's you know, journalism. Journalism is I guess it's mm -hmm. having just being really interested in the world and wanting to hear other people's stories and not just mm. thinking about yourself the whole time. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Uh, we, I think we've got time for one last question before we wrap up then. Um, this one has been sent in and this person says, what advice would you give to people from a low income slash disadvantaged background who might be anxious about getting started in the industry? Um, Sam, I know you touched a bit on diversity earlier. Do you want to come in on this one? Um. Yeah, I would just say that, um, that from my from what I've seen, uh, the kind of the there's now is the time that people are, re are are ready to listen, and more so than they have been in the past. And so, I mean, I think this just ties into a kind of a broader thing, which is sort of thinking about what makes you you, you know, kind of what makes you um, you know, kind of un if not unique, what are your experiences that are key to you, and sort of. Don't be afraid to talk about that and and be okay with that and sort of celebrate that in in whatever way feels good. Uh, I would say when you're talking to, talking about ideas, when you're kind of looking for work experience, that kind of thing. It's it's you know kind of that's what people want to bring and what will you bring that nobody else would. So uh, yeah, but I I guess the the sort of more difficult thing about there is is you know not everybody has the um, the funds to sort of uh, pay for accommodation in London and that kind of thing. And I suppose that's where, um, you know, kind of being nice and, and kind of being a, kind of getting on with people helps and trying to sort of uh, uh, kind of gain as much support in that way. Don't be afraid to ask to get help if, if you need it, I suppose, from friends or something like that. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Louise, um, would you um, like to come in on this? Yeah, just really, I know we're running out of time, so just briefly two points on that. And um, um, We're talking about diversity and we're talking about ideas and diversity of ideas is absolutely key. And for example, we had on this week, um, there's a lovely producers of, of ours who I've worked with a bit, um, kind of mentoring and a little bit. Anyway, she got on the programme this week, her granny, who, who learned English when she was 65, she's now 88. And she got her granny and her granddaughter on the programme. And you know, without her, they would not have made the show. And that's absolutely part of what we do on BT Breakfast. So diversity, of, you know, in all forms, and especially, you know, if you can bring your ideas and your background and all the rest of it, that's fantastic. Um, and just just on the London thing, and I work in Media City UK, and big up Media City UK, <laughs> there are some fabulous opportunities there. 
uh, the cost of living is not nearly so much. And I genuinely think, I mean, I have loved working um, there and it's a completely different atmosphere to broadcasting house. And I think much, you know, I'm much more, open, I guess to be honest, much more open, much more welcoming, you know, go, you know, do not think that the whole world comes out of London because it really doesn't. And that's no offence to you, Sam. I just want to be that media city. <laughs> Oh, the northerner, oh. I'm very glad you brought it up. Uh, well, yes, uh, yes, like absolutely. I feel like I'm a northerner now. I'm, yes, yeah. as, as a as a Mancunian, I second that or third that. <laughs> Oh, fantastic. Well, that's that's fantastic to hear. Um, that is all we have got time for this evening. And I just want to say I'm very sorry to anyone who sent in a question and we've not had time to touch on it. Uh, but we are hosting a couple more events throughout the week. This is Star Careers Week. So if you're interested in music production, we have Jamie and John hosting a music production workshop tomorrow. And a couple of people have written about um, written in, sorry, about applications and CVs and the Career Centre is very kindly helping us put up put on a CV workshop later in the week. So keep an eye on our social media for more information on all of that. Um, all that remains for me to do then is to say thank you to uh, Andrew and Ramsey who've helped me put this event together and to thank our wonderful panellists Tim Samuels, Amanda Litherland, Robbie Collins, Sam Peach and, Lu and Louise Minchin. Uh, I would give you a big virtual round of applause but it will just be me. Um, so thank you so much everybody. I cannot tell you how much we appreciate this. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers. Take thank care. you. Everybody.